Okay, big picture. How do we get back an America that works? Mike Rowe gives us the macro. I'm James Polis. This is Zero Hour. For most of you, he's a man who needs no introduction, but you get it anyway. Mike Rowe is an Emmy award-winning TV host, producer, narrator, podcaster, spokesman, best-selling author, recording artist, and America's leading advocate for the skilled trades. He's the CEO of the Mike Rowe Works Foundation, and he's awarded nearly $7 million in work ethic scholarships and led to a national effort to reintroduce shop class into high schools, which he is delighted to report seems to be working. Nine million, but who's counting? Who's counting? Mike, how are you? <laughs> I'm great, man. And by the way, you made me laugh. About 10 years ago, I pitched a, a documentary series called Micro Macro and almost sold it in the room because they thought it was so clever. Almost. There's still time. But then I pitched the actual idea and they were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but a title matters. You know? Yeah, well, title matters. You're, you're smiling. So it seems like things are, are, are pretty good by your lights. Um, uh, you know, I talk about tech a lot on this show. Uh, you're the you're the work guy. We're going to talk a lot about work. Um, question I get a lot of the time is, well, aren't the bots going to take all the jobs away? <laughs> what do yeah. you say? I get that a lot, but it's weird. You know, for a long time, the robots seem to pose a kind of uh, blue collar existential threat. Sure. And now it's feeling like the AI thing is posing this white collar existential threat. And now both collars are freaking out because there's something beyond their control that seems to be coming. I don't know, man. I, I mean, if you read up on the Luddite Rebellion, was it 17, 1600s, whatever it was, the Loomers? I mean, history's a wheel. It's always turning. And the things that frighten us are pretty much the same boogeymen. They come back in different clothes. You know, not to minimize any of this, it's sure. it's going to have an impact. It already has, and it's going to continue to have an impact. But I don't have a, uh, my crystal ball is cloudy with regard, even to the short term, with the impact of tech on the jobs in my world. I, I tend to think that plumbers and steam fitters and pipe fitters and electricians and carpenters, I, I don't think they're going to be outsourced. I, I could be wrong, but the kind of robot that I'm envisioning would have to be extraordinarily facile and dexterous to get my toilet out of my bathroom and up the stairs and out, right? I mean, so I'm not worried about that. But I do think I, the part of my crystal ball that I, that I think is working says the color of collars is yesterday's news. That ship has already sailed, and we're just kind of clinging to this idea that we still have this blue-collar, white-collar workforce. I, I don't see it. I see a lot of men and women in the sorts of jobs my foundation focuses on who are tech wizards. I mean, auto mechanics today? I don't know. I, I used to be able to change my oil and my brakes. I open up the hood now, and I look at that thing. It's like... There's a hood under the hood. That's a spaceship. So... It's a, you need a software understanding, like really uh, to, to make sense of that device. And I see this again and again and again. And so I suspect there's just going to be a big uh, blending of things. And the only color that's going to matter regarding collars is going to be sort of a grayish hue with a touch of, maybe a touch of blue. Yeah. And a little bit of a crew or maybe ivory Ooh, in oh, there. I like it. Maybe yeah. Eggshell. Okay, eggshell. Good. Okay, so this is really interesting. Let's let's dig into this a little bit. I mean, some of these jobs that people are worried about losing are kind of BS jobs, <laughs> right? And I think a lot of people, you know, especially now coming out of the pandemic, would be the first to admit, like, yes, my job is not really a real job. I'm kind of just sitting there. There is a lot of slack in the system, isn't there? Oh, God. There is... But I'm afraid if we like arbitrage the importance uh, out of the work or look only at the perks or at the money, then 
there's this other thing that's hard to articulate, but still very much for sale. You know, it's the, um, well, it's the meaning. It's the individual meaning that you get to assign to the lower rungs on the ladder. So as you were talking, I, I'm just, I kind of default to the unintended consequences of what happens when well-intended policies get pushed through onto a workforce. And uh, I mean, maybe it's the minimum wage. We just went to 20 bucks in California for fast food restaurants. How long until all those kids who are getting their working careers started in that kind of job are going to be iced out of the whole transaction because a kiosk is going to replace them. It's going to replace them. That's the robot that's coming. Well, and it's especially going to replace them if, I mean, this is happening in Oakland right now where all the Taco Bells are closing down the, uh, the, the in-person transactions because of crime. Of course. So, and those policies also were well-intended, sure. right? But I, I think, and I know this is your bailiwick more than mine, but it, it just seems to me that if you look at the unintended consequences of everything from crime bills to the minimum wage to rent control, you can extrapolate it right into the workforce and you can see how work is, is directly impacted by those kinds of policies and by that kind of tech, right? And sometimes the tail wags the dog, you know, people are going to get angry at that kiosk in the Burger King when they walk in. They're going to kind of curse at it, but not as loudly as they would curse when the double Whopper with cheese comes in at $18, Yeah, right? So the air has to be let out of the tire. And that's why, for me, you know, on Dirty Jobs, we looked for, we looked for people who found meaning in their work, regardless of the rung it occupied on the ladder. With MicroWorks, we try and focus on vocations that don't require a four-year degree, but still offer a path to something that, that looks an awful lot like prosperity. And typically, when you focus on those opportunities, you see impacts of tech, you see impacts of AI, but you don't see them being completely and totally replaced. A little disrupted, maybe. Yeah. but not replaced. Yeah, well, we need your voice. I mean, this <clears throat> might be my bailiwick, I guess, uh, but we need your voice, we need voices like yours. When we turn to the tech guys, uh, they say, oh yeah, no, don't worry, like all the jobs <laughs> aren't gonna go away. Uh-huh. Uh, you're gonna be able to be a like, a like a seasonal closet refresher where you can help people kind of spruce up their wardrobe. It's gonna be uh, great, yeah. You know, you can be a greeter, mm -hmm. um, you can be like, a, like an elevator attendant, you know, like press the button, you know, just this kind of like, uh, a, a, a sort of like a, a, a 21st century kind of customer service, little little sprinkle of pixie dust. You're talking about things that are much more substantial and really allow people to uh, to get their hands dirty and to connect what's going on in their head with what's going on uh, in the world around them. Well, let's go back to micro macro. I'm really talking about that. You know, I was here years ago, I think in this studio, probably 10 years ago. Glenn gave me a shirt. I don't know if he's still if he still has his clothing line. He was trying to make clothes in this country. I think it was 1781. I still have the shirt. It's terrific. And I've been in business over the years with a lot of small companies who are trying to make stuff here. And sometimes just a t-shirt. Some could be a pair of boots. These are made in Michigan. Could be whatever. But the business of bringing that back into the country, that's macro. That's a huge undertaking. But the only way to talk about it I think, is through a t-shirt or something simple, a simple garment, right? And so if you talk about the small things in context with these big ideas, people begin to understand because they can wear a shirt. They can see it. They can touch it. But I, I do worry that the unintended consequence of a consumer economy has been the, well, I was going to say gradual, but not so gradual. We... We can't even make toothpicks in this country anymore, or at least we don't want to, you know? So a T-shirt, if we can't make T-shirts and toothpicks, what hope does Detroit have, really, right? So anyway, I say all that because in the end, the ideas get so big and the challenges get so grand that a lot of people, they just don't know how to think about it. But during the lockdown, we 
we got a sense of what it felt like, I think, to be disconnected from a great many things. And if there was a silver lining in that whole hot mess, I think maybe it could be a heightened appreciation for the business of some of those lower rungs on the ladder, and I put lower in air quotes, because there's no way to get to the higher ones unless you work your way up, and maybe a heightened appreciation for the business of making simple things. Because if we can't get that figured out, how are we going to get our medicine back? How are we going to get our semiconductors back from Taiwan? How, I mean, right? So it's only enormous and small at the same time. Well, as a native, or at least a, a born Michigander, I, I love the boots. Got to respect the boots. Um, <clears throat> it is, it's so important that people remember, and we help them remember, that your smartphone isn't the only thing at your fingertips. <laughs> Right? Like just about the entire world is at your fingertips, but right in front of you. And you know, it's yes, yes, be intelligent, yes, learn, yes, um, expand your mind, sure. Uh, but it just kills me how we've almost adopted this worshipful attitude toward intelligence that is so focused on projecting our consciousness hmm. and our experience away from what's right at our fingertips. It's just a tool. Yeah. I mean, it's just another tool. I got mine right here, you know, and it might as well be a gun. I can use it for great mischief or great good, you know. Yeah. It's just a tool. Yeah. In the same way, these are just boots. Yeah. Except I saw the people make them. I, I saw them take the Horween leather up at the Wolverine plant. I saw them hand stitch it. I saw them take the... I mean, this is the same design from 1870. Oh, yeah. Right? They haven't changed it at all. But when you see that level of care getting plowed into something that's so utilitarian, you have to admire it. But the same relative level of care went into crafting that thing, for better or worse. And it's also funny, too, James. You know, when we look at this, we see like a, a model to uh, innovation. Great. It is. But nobody ever talks about the, the miracle of imitation that allowed that thing to enjoy the ubiquity that it has today. It wasn't just a question of getting the prototype figured out. You know, that's where the work begins. Otherwise, all you have is a little monument to yourself. That thing's a miracle because it's been duplicated hundreds of millions of times with almost no variance. That's amazing. Granted, 15 different versions. But the boots, same design, 140 years. Yeah. And we're, we're starting to see that, you know, these things aren't, aren't really evolving as fast as they used to. Uh, we're kind of starting to settle into that commodity level where you know what it is. Uh, it's been tested. It works. You stick with it. Back to the gun thing for a minute. Isn't mm -hmm. it interesting that, yeah. I don't know if you're into firearms. I'm not a complete nut, but I'm a fan and I, I, I appreciate the advancements that have been made over the decades. But when it comes right down to it, if you want a reliable sidearm, it's tough to beat the revolver. Yeah. It's very difficult to beat it. You can take it apart. You can clean its component parts. You know, the cylinder looks like a so Everything looks like it, right? And it goes back together. And it's reliable. And it works. This thing has apps on it that I, I don't remember downloading. It has the capacity to do things that I don't have the capacity to articulate. Oh, it's crazy. You got photos on there that you don't remember taking. You got apps that you I don't, don't remember downloading. Share. In fact, let me get this away from you because yeah, the, the whole, <laughs> the photo thing. I mean like that's, but it's a, like what, what is a more powerful combination? A gun protected by the second amendment or that thing protected by the first. Like the fact that I could go on Facebook now and hit live stream and hold it up right now and start beaming this to 7 million people. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. Cut into your ratings. Be rude. Appreciate but, that. But you know what I mean? It's like this is, we this country, like we talk a lot about the hundreds of millions of firearms out there. I get it. It's a thing. Everybody in the country is armed with this. We are now all citizen reporters, observers, chroniclers, blackmailers. It's, it's mind-boggling to me that nobody talks about the relationship between that 
and a gun vis-a-vis the first two rights in the bill of. Yeah, and there's so much more that we can do with technology than just use it to create more and more words. You know, I mean, I'm in the words business. I, you know, I'm I'm not here to say that we should all stop talking, but uh, we have this powerful technology and so much of what we do uh, involves just creating this this parallel universe of, of thoughts and words, and it does disconnect us from our bodies, and it does cause us to forget all of the other things that we can do. Right, because it comes at you so fast. Yeah, It is like a shotgun yeah. in the way that you, you can hit a lot of things, but it's difficult to bring anything down because you're swiping left or you're scrolling up, and there's another reel, and oh my God, that cat was cute, and look at that dog, it jumped over a tree. Honey, get in here and look at this, and before you know it, we're all squirrels looking at squirrels. Yeah. We <laughs> got to remember that we can use technology in ways that work with us, with our innate human capabilities. And this is the other side of it. You know, I get a lot of uh, pushback when I, when I talk about what I th- believe are the inequities in the way we promote certain forms of education, specifically that a four-year path is the best path for the most people. I think the unintended consequences of that nonsense are uh, monumental. But a couple of weeks ago, I watched a, uh, a lecture at MIT in real time for free on this thing, for free. I'm, I'm looking at the kids in the class and that they're spending thousands of dollars for this. That they might not have. <laughs> well, I just think that, you know, I, I didn't have this when I was in college. Part of what I was paying for back then was access to information. Now, along with all the cat videos and the squirrels and the adorable, shareable little reels, is access to 98% of all the known information in the world. And so while I'm no giant fan of Zoom classes, and while I think that was a, a sad substitute for what a lot of kids missed out on during the lockdowns, it's an amazingly powerful way to think about how we could reimagine a liberal arts education at a cost that everybody could afford. It's not Zoom, but it's not Dartmouth or Brown either, necessarily. It's it's something in between that might be informed by your first question. The tech, the robots, the AI, the ubiquity of the device, the curiosity of the species, hopefully that can come together. Because my liberal arts degree served me well. I, I, I wish everybody had one, but it cost me 12 grand in 1984, it's like $98,000 today. Yeah. Same course load, same schools, yeah. right? Yeah. That's no good. They say that good men create good times. Well, the same's true of businesses. Good people are the bedrock of successful enterprises. But unfortunately, today, the hiring pool is bleak. Political demands, petty entitlement, open incompetence, they're all commonplace. You need to reach the people who are keen to join your business. New Founding has created a network of these high excellence professionals who are seeking to join grounded, pro-American businesses. These are individuals, often in elite organizations, who are ready to go for a team and a mission that supports their values instead of working against them. Aligned companies are using this network right now to hire high trust, exceptional individuals who match the culture and the mission of their teams. Join the New Founding Talent Network. Find your next hire. Apply for access to the Newfounding Talent Network at newfounding.com backslash talent. You'll get connected with the candidates who will build up your business. That's newfounding.com backslash talent. All right, let's talk about education. Uh, are we too overeducated? Is there too much education in America? Uh, I think we're, yeah, I think we're overeducated. I, but I also think conversely, or maybe perversely, we're we're underinformed. <laughs> yeah, underinformed and overeducated. That's the yeah. uh, worst of both worlds, isn't it? Well, I, I mean, what is the purpose of uh, information without direction or or knowledge without application? I, I, I feel like, I feel like we know a lot of things that we don't necessarily do anything with, and the things maybe we ought to know, we we don't have at our ready disposal. I know that. Um, Part of the reason I think people are, are starting to sour a little bit on the cookie cutter advice about, you know, college for all uh, is exactly that. You know, you've got never mind one point seven trillion dollars in student loans on the books and the giant conversation about should we forgive that or not? I'll forgive it. I'm not going to forget it. 
don't want to pay it either. But it's this, no one talks about the fact that 41% of people who start don't graduate. Yeah. Or that something like 85% of people who do graduate wind up not working in their chosen field. Mm -hmm. There's just so many things about the, the primacy of a four-year uh, transaction that, that don't get laid out honestly. And so parents and, and kids, unfortunately, have never, at least in my lifetime, I think had an honest chance to look at all the options. Yeah. Well, you know, I think many of us uh, in this country still like to think of ourselves as, as individualists. Uh, but there's also, you know, there's a clear strain in American life where if there's a path, if there's a pattern, people follow it. They want that path. They mm. want to have something that they can focus on and measure their, their, their competitiveness with. And I think that's what happened with, with four-year college. You know, I, I got to get my kid into the best college they can get into. Why? Well, because that's what everyone else is doing. And I don't want my kid to be left behind. Well, okay. Uh, and we see what happened. A lot of unintended consequences there. A lot of kids who went through that system came out on the other side. They're working a job that is less fulfilling, pays not as good, and you know maybe it's not as physically dangerous as what their, their father or their grandfather was working. But yeah, then you might not get decapitated at the factory, but you're hunched over your, you know, your, your terminal in your cubicle uh, under this light that's draining your life away for you know, most, most of your waking hours. Like That's no good either. So my point is, you got these other alternatives out there, and more people are starting to turn to them, and they are starting to question that, that four-year track as the default. Uh, but those alternatives, you gotta kinda, gotta kinda hunt your way through and, and find your own path. There isn't a path that's laid out for people, and I think that if there was more of a path that they did understand, they'd be more likely to say, like, I, you know, I want that for my kid. Yeah, maybe, but then again, th th that's the thing about a, a path. It's, it's, it's kind of exciting when you, when you find one where you didn't think one was, yeah. right? You need enough to see that somebody else went there before, but not too many people, right? Because then you're part of the herd. Right. You're just a wildebeest. Right. Next thing you know, you wander off and you're getting eaten by a crocodile and a hyena. That's no good. Paths are, are, are funny that way. Some people want to discover one. Some, some people still want to blaze one. See what I did there? Very good. They want to forge their own way. They want to, they want to go where nobody's gone before. That makes for great cinema. Most, most people don't really want that. They want a hint of a way forward, right? Others, they'll, they'll take the highway. But that's my point. People are all, all different, even with regard to, to paths. And I think that in the, in the skilled trades, the paths are sometimes a little confusing because they're so multitudinous, right? In my foundation, I can't tell you how many people will start with maybe a $7,000 welding certificate. Now, some will take that certificate and figure out how to be the best possible welder that it, they can be, and they'll stay in the basic vertical of welding, maybe even wind up doing underwater welding. I know guys making three, $350,000 a year doing that. That's bananas. But it happens all the time. There's these very, very precise, delicate forms of, of welding. You can live in that vertical, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people start there, and then they'll get a plumbing license or maybe an electrician's license. Next thing you know, they could buy a van, and they got a buddy who does heating and air conditioning, and they got a cousin who does the electric thing, and now they got a mechanical services contracting company. There's so many of these all over the country. And the one thing they all have in common, James, is that they are busy. They're booked 60, 70 hours a week. They're as busy as they want to be. And, uh, and that path is very different looking on paper than the path to an actuarial accountant or a litigator, right? Those paths are clear and they've got little touch points and you can see kind of how it goes. But the skilled trades, it's more like a wall of ivy on the side of a building. You, you could do that, you could do that, right? And so it's, a, it's part the nature of the skills that are inherent to the vocations, 
but it's also the, the mindset of a, of a tradesman, a tradeswoman, a tradesperson, you know, jobbers, yeah. giggers, freelancers. All of that is sort of baked into that lifestyle as well, including, I think, uh, a willingness to move. I find that's more um, uh, prevalent with people who master a skill because there's an understanding that you kind of have to go to where the work is. Um, not so much in a typical white collar world. Um, now it's me painting with a broad brush, but that's just what I've, what I've seen. So it's, it's a lot, you know, it's, the, it's not just the education, it's the mindset, and it's, it's trying to, to, to find that path that you're comfortable taking uh, and then just finding some checkpoints along the way that will hopefully uh, reaffirm your decision or maybe say, in the words of Jimmy Page, there's still time to change the road you're on. Yeah. I'm just letting you monologue here because this is so profound. I mean, there's so much to talk about just in this area. <clears throat> we do live in a country where oftentimes people do feel like they're, they're pushed to extremes. Um, and if you go back and read Alexis de Tocqueville or some other guys, you know, you get a portrait of Americans who are always swinging between sort of throwing themselves into public life and the scramble for advantage and position and, and you know, material riches that come and go and there's all this churn. When they're not doing that, they sort of like go home and just brood inwardly and just feel melancholy and like the time's passing them by. That's the old uh, quiet, uh, quiet desperation. Right, but people, you know, I think people really do want to, to lock into that kind of middle way where you travel but not too much you kind of have to like stay on your toes, but but not too much, and you want that that magic mix of stability and improvisation. Yeah, that's nailing Jello to a tree, yeah. right? You, you can do it, but what you forget is that the tree is constantly growing, mm -hmm. and you're constantly getting older. And whatever felt like balance to you a year ago, or six months ago, or six weeks ago, might not feel that way anymore. Like, how do, you, how do you know when you've traveled too much mm -hmm. over the course of a year? You know it when it's too late. You know it when you're looking at one more residence in, and you haven't been home in three weeks, and you're just wearing the same stuff, and you really, you're like, you know what? I, too much. Too much. How do you know when you don't travel enough? I was traveling 300 days a year there for a while, and then the show took a hiatus, and I wasn't. And I was like, oh, it's going to be so great to be home, you know. And then a week later, it was like, yeah, this is nice. And like two weeks later, you know, a buddy of mine flew into town. And he said, hey, you want to meet for lunch? And I said, yeah. And he said, where? And I said, I'll meet you at the airport. The residence in. <laughs> no, man, I went. Well, I could have said that. <laughs> but their, uh, their, their breakfast uh, continental has taken a disappointing turn. It's not a residence. It's not an inn. It's a residence inn. But the... Uh, what is the other commercial? No, but I stayed in a Holiday Inn last night. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. No, I, I, point is, I, I wound up meeting my friend at the airport because I wasn't traveling enough and I needed to be. So sure. all of that is to say that you're an untrustworthy animal mm -hmm. and your feelings um, are not really uh, reliable much too far down the road. And people have to reserve the right to to change their mind. And that's okay. And that's, that's another thing I think we've, we've robbed our kids of. You must decide now what you want to be. Yeah. Okay, here's that path you talked about. You start by signing this, and then you're going to borrow some money. Yes, it's a lot, but it's an investment in your future. Now we're going to find the best school and so forth, and you're going to take these courses. If that's the path you're talking about, yeah, you're right. It's there, and it lives in the I think the memories of a lot of parents, and they don't want to screw their kids up, right? There's no real playbook for this, but they, right. they don't want to mess it up. So this worked for me, so it should work for you. And gosh, yeah, it is more expensive than it was, isn't it? Well, and that, that track was sold ideologically as this is the future. This is freedom. We are liberating your child. This, the world is going to open up to them. It's not going to be like the way that it was in the Dark Ages where, you know, well, I guess I'm just going to be the village shoemaker for the rest of my life, you know? <laughs> to, to bring that it back was the to boots. Right, to bring it back. You know, or, or like sitting there at the anvil and that's, that's your life and your world is never going to be any larger than that. 
fast forward to now and you've got whether you want to call it white white collar or whatever collar you want to call them i mean that is a kind of just indentured existence where your world does close in on itself and oh. sure maybe you have a smartphone that you can scroll through but that starts to become a loop too that's right especially depending on what you're scrolling yeah but yeah the the the, the whole indentured servitude thing that that's very agnostic that that doesn't care about the color of collars at all. Anybody can be miserable in any job. It's easy. Anybody can be engaged yeah. in any job. That was a big lesson of dirty jobs. Why are all these people who are doing these things that my mom and dad warned me I'd be stuck doing if I didn't get a degree, why are they having so much fun? Why does everybody seem so engaged in the work? Don't they know they're covered with other people's crap? This, this isn't supposed to be fun. And then, what do you mean, Mike? What do you mean he's making $115,000 a year with nothing but a high school diploma? What is that? So, you know, the, the fun of that show was, was making it. It was a hot mess of unpredictable calamities. But, <laughs> but the point of it was that once you, once you get permission, once the viewer... Once you have them, once they're watching, then you can gently infect them with your own worldview. And my worldview was, these people are smarter than you think. They're happier than you think. They're craftier than you think. They're living a more balanced life than you think. And I'm going to prove it over time. And it took time, but that, right? So again, don't paint with too broad a brush. Here's a, here's a quick analogy that I think makes the point. In 2016, I guess it was, Marco Rubio was on stage with the other 16 in the midst of some presidential uh, debate or something. And uh, he got a great line, he had a great applause line when he said, what our country needs are fewer philosophers and more welders. Yeah. Remember, everybody clapped. And that night on my social channels, I with hundreds of people saying, hey, that, that sounds like your guy. And I was like, yes and no, but mainly no. That's, that's not what I mean to say. What this country needs are, are, more, are more welders who can talk about existentialism, Descartes, Nietzsche, Thoreau. We need more welt welders who, who took the time to access this tool in a good way and satisfy their curiosity in a liberal arts way. And conversely, we need more big thinkers, more philosophers who can run an even bead, <laughs> right? It's a, it, back to the color of collars. Why does it have to be welders versus philosophers? Why does it have to be doctors versus plumbers? They both kind of do the same thing. Remember when business used to be about making money, taking care of your customers, and providing for your family? What happened? Wokeness, DEI, and ESG have conquered America's best companies. But the spirit of the American entrepreneur is still free. Now more than ever, the best founders in America are walking away from corrupt big corporations and blazing their own trail. New Founding is rallying these founders who just want to get back to that original American idea of building inspiring and disruptive companies, the best in the world. New Founding is investing in these companies through their venture fund. The companies they invest in are defined by a simple question. Does the country we want to live in need the company this person is building? Now you can join them. Venture investing isn't for everyone, but if you're a serious, accredited investor who wants to see a more hopeful future for this country, go to newfounding.com backslash venture fund and apply to be an investor. Again, that's newfounding.com backslash venture fund. Join their venture fund today. You think we need more politicians who are, I don't know, guys like you? I think we need more politicians who are suspicious of the power that the office holds. I, I really believe, you know Mike Gregory, that name, I think his name was 
my, my middle name's Gregory. My not, Gallagher. His name was Mike Gallagher. Ah, right. And I, he was a representative up in uh, maybe Michigan. I, I can't remember if he's Congress or Senate or whatever. But he went sideways with the GOP when he said, look, I, I don't like what's going on at the border, but I don't think impeaching my Orcus works. I think it's constitutionally wobbly, and I just don't think we should do it. Well, they, they ate him alive, right? The GOP did. And he said, I want to hell with you. I'm out. I'm not going to run again. You know, I gave it a shot. I gave you some years. This is a former military guy who did what I think the founders always talked about doing, right? Be a citizen. Build something. You know, do something. And then if you feel called to serve, do it for four, six, maybe eight years. Maybe two terms if you're Washington, right? But then after that, do us all a favor. Get out. Go back to your family. Go back. <laughs> Who, in what model is anybody supposed to be holding public office for decades? Would you ever do it? Run Hold it for, for decades? <laughs> no, no, no. A couple years, four years, eight years. You know, it, so this is weird. I've, I've spent the last 22 years saying, absolutely not. Absolutely positively not. I can do more good with my foundation. I can be a better jagged little pill outside of the machine. And I still believe that. But I don't, uh, I don't know what to, to think about like this moment. Yeah, I mean, it really is, like it always feels new, right, to us because we're, we're living now. History is a wheel. We've been here before. It's not the most divisive the country's ever been, but it's something. It's I, quite a moment. I've never seen this. And I, you know, with great respect to both candidates, I'd, I feel like the country walked into a restaurant, their favorite restaurant, <laughs> and the hostess gave them a menu, right? And there are only two things on it. And half the country is literally allergic to one, and the other half is allergic to the other. Like, is there, is there nothing on the menu at all for me? No gluten-free? <laughs> no. So, so many people, it, it seems to me, feel that way. So, look, I, I don't know what to do about that, but I am, I, I, don't, know what the, I don't know what the No Labels Party is going to do. I don't know what RFK Jr. is going to do. But I hope he does something, because I just think people need to have something else on the frickin' menu, man. Well, you're definitely a man with a feel for the heartland, and uh, that's becoming more important. I mean, I don't think anyone's calling into question. People are leaving the coast. Maybe it's not a stampede, but there's a degree of dissatisfaction and of yearning for something that has more staying power or substance to it than that kind of, that stereotypical life on the coast. I'm afraid that, that, I mean, there's not much new to say about the collapse of faith and trust in our institutions. It's, it's profound. And uh, what's alarming, I think, is that I, I can't find any institution who isn't suffering from it right now. Certainly the political class. I, I, has there ever been a lower disapproval rating for Congress? Has there ever been more skepticism uh, of anybody who, who wants power? I, I, don't, I don't think so. But is the media any better? is medicine, medicine's on the ropes. We, it's a heck of a thing, man, to turn on the TV and see two exalted doctors disagreeing. It's a heck of a thing when the experts on everything disagree. Yeah. And I, 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 I can't speak for anybody but me, but I, I have been to every state half a dozen times at least. And what I believe I share most in common with the people that I run into is this feeling that we're all in the crowd in Hans Christian Andersen's story, right? The emperor's new clothes. We're all the townspeople, and we're all looking, and this guy's naked. <laughs> we can see it, but, but we're not saying anything. We're waiting for somebody to, to say, hey, you know? And in the story, that person was a kid who didn't know any better. 
who blazed that trail that then people started going, wait a minute, there's a trail there. That's the trail. Yeah. That, that was the road not taken. And then pretty soon everybody took it. And then suddenly, when you realize you're naked, you know, the trajectory of your own narrative starts to change, which I love. Aristotle said that the definition of a tragedy is the moment in the narrative when the protagonist comes face to face with the inescapable truth of his own reality. <laughs> Sometimes that happens when a kid says, hey, that, that guy's naked. Or maybe a kid looks at the NCAA finals and says, hey, mommy, that, that woman doesn't seem like the other women. How did she win that? And then all of a sudden it's okay to have a conversation about something that's not okay to have a conversation about. Yeah. I think, I feel like everybody is teetering on the edge of saying, did they say that was a successful withdrawal from Afghanistan? It said, the man in the suit and tie just told me it was successful. My trusted source of news just said it was. But are those people falling out of a plane right now? Is that border really secure? Because, God, that looks, like, that looks like thousands of people coming across it. So it's like the way you're nodding your head right now, I think, is the way many millions of people feel. Because they've just spent a couple of years being told that up is down and left is right and black is white and so forth. And so I don't know what to say to somebody who is admittedly skeptical of anything right now. It better be. I can't blame them. Well, it, you know, it's, it's so easy to criticize and it's easy to see where we're falling down. It's easy to see where our weakest points are. How can we identify not just where our greatest weaknesses are, but how we can go to those places and turn things around so that we're stronger there again? See, that's why I'm not in politics. That's such a great macro question. And, and those men and women who attempt to answer it are going to have to paint, unfortunately, with a broad brush because they've got to cover 330 million people. At MicroWorks, the only way I've been able to answer that is to say, I've got to show you examples of individuals who have prospered as the result of learning a skill that's in demand. And there's just no substitute for it. You have to meet them personally. I have to show them to you, maybe on camera, but I have to give you examples. I have to get a work ethic curriculum into high schools. And then I have to attach a scholarship program to that and we need to, I need to show you what happens when we reward the behavior that we want to encourage and vice versa. There's just no substitute for it. Kids today, their BS meters are finely, finely, finely tuned. And in the same way I'm saying that grown-ups have become inherently skeptical of all our treasured institution, it's that times 10 for kids. How are you gonna, how are you gonna tell a Generation Z today how am I going to tell that kid what path to take? How, how unpersuasive am I? Here I sit, older than I've ever been, comfortable in my dotage, screaming off of my back porch about the road not taken. This road's better than that road. That's not persuasive. They need to hear it from somebody that they, that they recognize and somebody that they trust. And those people are in short supply. You got to get out there and live it. Just listening to people tell you what's going on is not a substitute. I'll leave you with one more question. Um, you think there's a new frontier coming in America? You think people are ready to sort of blaze those trails now? And when they look around and they feel like maybe there's no path where they are? I think, I think sometimes things have to go splat before that happens. And I hope there's not some giant universal national splat, you know, like a 9-11 or a Pearl Harbor. I, I, hope, I hope we're not talking about a thing that has to horrify in order to galvanize. But I, but I do see it happening on smaller levels. I, I do see people changing their minds with, like in my lane, I see people seriously questioning the primacy of a four-year degree who never would have done it five, six years ago. I'm not taking a victory lap for that, but I'm saying that the, it's starting to land. 
it takes a long, it, perceptions have a long tail. And, you know, w- what I deal with primarily in this whole education workspace is challenging the stigmas and the stereotypes and the myths and the misperceptions that keep kids from pursuing the 11 million open opportunities right now, right? So I, I, I do that as best I, I, as I can, and, and I have seen attitudes start to change, but it's going to happen in dribs and drabs. Is there some great new frontier? Is there going to be an awakening, right? We've had awakenings before. Yeah, probably, but I would no more predict that than I would the, uh, exactly when the robots are coming with their big IA brains to take our jobs. Well, sometimes a little splat goes a long way. Sometimes. Uh, you know, talking this way, and I just appreciate your candor and your thoughtfulness. Uh, <clears throat> it, it seems to me that in some sense, maybe your path has only really just begun. Maybe. What did Frost say? Uh, Two roads diverged in a yellow wood. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't travel both. Be one traveler. Long I stood, looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Took the other, just as fair, having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear. But as for that, the passing there had worn him really about the same. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood. And I, I took the one less traveled by. And that's made all the difference. Everything that Descartes and Thoreau and Walden said, Frost said better, with great respect. But there are lots of paths. And as Robert Plant sang it, there's still time to change the, uh, the road you're on. Mike Rowe, I'm adding poet to the bio. That was all plagiarized, man. Yes. Oh, shameless plug, real quick. Please. We got a million bucks. We're giving it away right now over at microworks.org. These are work ethic scholarships, help train the next generation of skilled workers. We do this every year, usually a couple million dollars over the course of a year. That's making a difference too. So yay us, but go get some. Honestly, you got to jump through some hoops. They're work ethic scholarships, but they work. On that note, thank you so much, Mike. We'll, we'll see you around. I'll be here. I mean, can I have a book? Of course. But first, oh. I have to say... That's all the time we've got today. So give us a like and a subscribe. Comment below. Let me know who you want me to interview next. Until then, I'm James Polis. This is Zero Hour, and may God have mercy on us all.